Hello, how are you today? I'm fine, Pastor John. How are you? Good, thank you for asking. You had a question for me? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. My question is, does God exist? And if so, how do we know? Oh, wow. Okay. Well, those are very good questions, actually. And um, the um, we want to separate them. The, those are two separate questions. So <clears throat> the... Um, the basic uh, response or reply to the first question is, does God exist? The short answer is, um, yes, he does. Uh, he, he not only exists, but he's also a personal God, and he has a name, and his name is Jesus Christ. And, um, well, that's the short answer. And the other part, then, is... Uh, so how do we know? If so, how do we know that that is, that, that is so, or that there could be so, or maybe so? Mm -hmm. So what I just want to briefly look at is um, um, the, uh, basically the, 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 the question people of, often has is when they ask, does God exist, is that they actually, there's a perception or even a presupposition that it could possibly be so. That God exists. And that's good. That's good. So people are asking, mm -hmm. if somebody said, well, I, I, I believe God doesn't exist, well, why would they even ask the question in the first place, right? Unless right. they're trying to waste our time. Let's hope that not be the case. Right. So that's a good start. So mm -hmm. yeah, so super great, right? That's super. Um, so um, what we want to look at briefly is we want to look at the question of, um, are there just generally... Uh, at, about the existence of God, um, are there any arguments uh, for the existence of God? Right. Or we could say, do we have arguments mm -hmm. that um, you know would indicate or or indicate the existence of God? That's the first part. Then, as I just said to you, um, we are I'm talking about it. We're talking about a personal God. God not only I'm saying God not only exists, but he has a name, and his name is Jesus Christ. So in the second part, we just want to briefly think about Jesus Christ, his life, death, and his resurrection, and a little bit about the evidence surrounding that. Okay. And um, just just see what we can find out, mm -hmm. um, both inside the Bible and outside. The Bible, right? It's if somebody has, says the Bible says, oh, oh, that's easy for you to say. Well, the Bible, anybody can say that. Yeah, mm, yeah. But there are also maybe are there any external sources to consider? Right. So yeah, if we're going to look at that, and lastly, under if we if we not only assume but we uh, read in the Bible and we 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 think about Jesus and we um, believe not only that God exists but that He does. Uh, that he is a personal God and has a name, Jesus Christ. What does that mean for us? What what re responsibilities do we have? Okay. Like, what do we do with that? Really? Right. So those are the three parts we're going to look at briefly. Okay. So um, in the first part, in the first segment, now we're going to think about different ways um, of 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 reasoning. Um, namely, um, the question is um, if something. It can exist. It could exist. Um, it does. It, that's regardless if we are aware of it or know it. So, in other words, um, we may not be aware that something exists, but it does exist. So, we have to consider, right? Mm -hmm. are, are we even aware of something existing? Okay. So that's the first point. And the second point is, if we say, if we say, if we affirm that yes, something does exist, or someone does exist. Then the question is um, uh, whether whether or not we know it exists. So that's another question to ask: whether we know something or someone exists. Okay. Now, if if that can be answered positively, namely something or someone we know, someone or something exists, um, we may be able to know something, but we may be unable to guide others to that specific knowledge for whatever reason. There may be, you know, a language barrier or some form of 
you know, we may not be able to communicate. Another person's not receptive or we're not relating it properly or whatever, okay. but it still doesn't invalidate the first two points. Mm -hmm. So they remain. So th that's the, that's the third part to consider. And then the fourth part is assuming that we're dealing with, um, uh, solid facts. Um, the question is, um, if a specific reason, um, is valid, um, does that, does that actually, um, uh, provide for or offer a proof of something? So, um, that means we're not talking about probable probabilities or something might be so, or it could be so, or statistics say, right. but it is, it is, if, if a specific reason holds, we, we assume that it is, then does it, does it make up or constitute a proof? So those are the four basic parts. There's a fifth part, mm -hmm. fifth part in this line of reasoning. Mm -hmm. And under the assumption that a proof exists, the question is, is it established by a scientific method, namely observation, experiment, or measurement, making it a scientific proof? That is a valid, very important question. Mm -hmm. And we can, we can positively, if we could affirm, uh, when it comes to God, we can affirm the first four okay. under the assumption that God does exist. They are possible. The fifth one we cannot. Why not? Because the reason is God cannot be proven scientifically. We can't prove him scientifically. Okay. And there's a reason for that. I'm just going to explain that very briefly. Um, in science, basically, the way science works is... Um, the line of reasoning that people use, the, the method, um, usually uh, is, it's called, what the scientists use is an inductive argument. So an inductive argument basically works like this. Um, as an example, I have a bag full with coins, mm -hmm. right? And I can't see the coins. But there's, there's a whole bunch of coins in there. I don't know how many, maybe. It doesn't matter. Even if I did, it doesn't matter. Right. But they, they, they all look, they, 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 they all appear the same. So I can't see them. But um, they look like they have all the same properties. So a bag of coins. Okay. So I pull out a coin three times. And every time I pull out the coin, it turns out to be a penny. Does that mean that all the coins in the bag are pennies? It could. It could, but it doesn't have to. Yeah. Right? So that's yeah. inductive. So there we have a statistical moment. It can be so, but it doesn't have to be so. Right. So that's called, basically, that's inductive reasoning. Okay. Pretty much, right? Okay. The other form is called deductive reasoning. And deductive reasoning is um, it's just a different form of logic. Um, is where conclusion is based on examination of facts. So basically when, so a conclusion logically follows the premises. So as an example, we, um, we say, all men are mortal. Caesar was a man. Therefore, Caesar was mortal. It right. cannot be any other way. Right. I read again. All men are mortal. Caesar was a man. Therefore, Caesar was mortal. Deductive, okay. deductive argumentation, yeah. pretty straightforward. It can only be so in, a, in that specific case. Yeah, that it cannot sense. be any other way. Yeah. Now, what we're going to look at in this case is the so-called abductive argument. So, in other words, um, this is pretty much based on deduction, what we just said. Mm -hmm. And an abductive argument is... Um, looking for observations or something that would uh, help us uh, formulate a hypothesis that would best fit or plausibly, plausibly explain certain observations. So out of our deductive line of reasoning, what yes. we just said, we would look for the uh, create a hypothesis or an argument that would best fit the best, the best possible explanation. Okay. And that leads us into, into a uh, philosophical uh, ground, so philosophical reasoning. So while we cannot 
prove God scientifically. And think about it, that would not be kind of, well, it would be something, right? I mean, if God would be, we would be able to prove him scientifically, well, Jesus would not have had to die for us on the cross, as an example, from our biblical perspective, right? Right. It would not, or a baby is born mm -hmm. with like a tag on it. Hey, welcome to the world, you little one, you know, her or him or whatever. Hey, and there's a little tag, and this is your way to be saved. And that is through faith in whatever, right? Yeah. So it's not, so we, that's not how God operates, right? So yes. God cannot be proven scientifically. But that's okay because mm -hmm. we can, uh, from what I just mentioned, the abductive argument, we can uh, have a um, philosophical proof that can provide a viable proof, but does not have to be scientific. Okay. Right? So the first four, remember in the beginning, the first four can be answered affirmatively. Yes. And then we have an abductive argument, and uh, that is then a a philosophical ground which can be uh, viable and truthful and uh, point to God but it does not have to be scientific so God made it so mm -hmm. isn't that kind of neat yeah it is so in that in that abductive uh, reasoning or uh, abductive model um, what is the best or most plausible explanation to a given problem there are basically um, uh, there, there are like 18 or 9, I think, 20 different models, like how the universe came into being and uh, how things exist and how things work and operate, mm -hmm. how the cosmos began and Big Bang and so on and so forth. The right. ontological argument is there, an ethical, moral, moral argument, 20 such arguments. And we're not going to go look at them all. We don't want to do that. Right. We just want to look at one and we're going to look at the what is called the design argument. In other words... Is there an intelligent, is there the possibility, let's say, start, of an intelligent design behind the origin, the beginning of the universe? Right. And for us as human beings, how does that connect to us? For us as human beings, was it just random chance that everything came into being, cosmos and us? Or was there intelligent design? So that's what, the, what, what is called the design argument. Okay. That's so one out of the 20 different lines of reasoning mm -hmm. which uh, in and by itself is neat when they accumulate when you put them together these all these different arguments from argument from morals design um, they're not all fully exactly deductive but they are um, all of them come from different lines of reasoning mm -hmm. but they interestingly enough all taken together make a strong case they point towards um, towards God just, just as really? a, yes, yeah. Okay. But um, let us just look at the design argument. So the design argument just basically says um, there are there are there are three there are just there are three options really that exist how how things came into being. So um, in other words, what is like what what evidence or explanation is possible? There's three possibilities. Okay. Possibility one is that. Um, uh, there is no explanation for everything. There is no explanation for everything. We can't explain pretty much nothing. Two, there is an impersonal explanation. There is an impersonal explanation. Uh, materialism or mysticism. Or three, there is a personal explanation. So... Those are the three possibilities in okay. this line of reasoning. And we're just going to look at the last one mm -hmm. um, for, uh, for, for argument's sake. And we find that Christianity is the best possible, uh, provides the best possible uh, explanation um, to explain the beginning the beginning of the universe and where mankind fits in. So in other words, that is called the, that is establishing the problem of the one and the many. Okay. So, okay, that's what's called the one and the many. One and the many. Um, so the problem is of establishing the one thing or whatever it is that lies behind all things in the universe. So all other worldviews are unable, 
I'm not talking about atheism or whatever worldviews. They, they, they can't explain very much, unfortunately. But I'm talking about other worldviews or religions or belief systems. Yes. They are unable to explain the, uh, the, the, um, to solve the problem of the one and the many. However, the Christian trinity, that is an infinite personal being as three in one, not three gods, but one God expressed in three persons, mm -hmm. God the Father, God the Son, our, our Lord Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit. So the triune God yes. um, as uncreated, personal um, God that establishes unity and diversity at the same time, simultaneously. It is, that is the best explanation. From a, from a purely philosophical worldview. And that's what we find in the Bible. The Trinity is mentioned. Right. And uh, I don't want to get into too much there. But so, um, and again, it points us even further, it points us directly to the person of Jesus Christ. In other words, aim for the guy in the middle, mm -hmm. if you're wondering about the three. Yeah. The Trinity is not easy to explain. Yes. And many attempt, people have tried to explain it and really were limited in our explanation of it. Mm -hmm. We know it exists, the Bible tells us about it, but it's also what we call the Godhead, the three persons. So uh, God, is, God is, has a specific unity, one God, and diversity, three persons, which we also call the Godhead. And that establishes the unit, unity and diversity in creation. So that's the Christian worldview. And that is basically what we come across in Genesis, how God created the world. Right. But he spoke the world into existence. And God said it was so. And it points directly to, to Jesus Christ as he came as God in the flesh. So it's the best, it's, it's the best approach. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some people have some preconceived ideas or notions or whatever. You know, some people are generally looking or seeking and they, um, they, you know, they never came across that or whatever. But the Bible tells us that and teaches that. So we have a triune God, mm -hmm. personal, uncreated being. And that is the, philosophically, it's the, best, it's the best explanation, which is not scientific. Right. So now we want to then consider, if we, if we go with that then, um, we, we think about the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, we have to ask, what is really unique so about him, right? And we're going to briefly go, was he a real person or not? Was this all historical or not? Okay. I'll touch upon that in a moment. Okay. Yeah, short answer is, yes, he was. So there's a historical person called Jesus Christ. But I'm just kind of, I'll get there in a moment. So, okay. So we want to ask, what was unique about Jesus? So from the Bible, so just solely based on the Bible as our reference source, uh, we, we learn that he was conceived of, by the Holy Spirit uh, to a virgin woman named Mary. So the Bible tells us that. That's, uh, that's absolutely unique. That has never happened e ever in, in human history. Yes. And uh, we uh, also learn about his, uh, in his baptism, we learn uh, that also affirms his divine nature. There's mm -hmm. a godly element. And at the baptism, something amazing happens. And I invite you, I encourage you to read about that, his baptism uh, in the Bible. And in, 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 you can read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, wherever you say, where, where the, the Trinity is, is uh, revealed. Okay. Right? I'm not going to give it away. You read it yourself. <laughs> okay. Look up, yeah, read about the, the baptism of Jesus. John the baptizer or John the Baptist okay. baptizes Jesus in mm -hmm. Jordan. As recorded in all three, uh, so all four Gospels, mm -hmm. I invite you to read that for yourself. Okay. And learn a bit more about the Trinity. Okay. And it's, let's see what you make of it. So, and while Jesus then, after he was then baptized, he, he did his ministry and teaching, he performed miracles. So, for example, he healed the sick, he healed the blind, he cast out impure spirits, and then he raised the dead. Now, those are things um, that... Uh, are absolutely unique to the Bible, the combination of all of these things, right? Uh, in and through the person uh, as recorded in the Bible, uh, what we would call miracles. I mean, there's many miracles today too. I mean, the fact that you and I are talking with each other <laughs> is a miracle too. Mm -hmm. But really, the things what when he was as Jesus was here, always pointing to himself, and when he taught, he taught with authority. In other words, 
he announced, he was always announcing the arrival of the kingdom of heaven. Namely, through himself has arrived. Jesus is here. I am here. I am here. I am with you. I am here. And um, so that's what we mean by authority, right? So right. Because he is God's word and God in the flesh. And, and he, he knows the word inside out. And so he always points back to himself through his miracles and his teaching. Now, he was uh, sentenced to death by the Romans. And uh, that was there was something they uh, his his Jewish fellow kinsmen, right? The the religious leaders at the time, uh, they uh, found they for whatever reason they decided uh, to uh, to deny him as God in the flesh, mm -hmm. and that's something we should not do. But they did, and um, uh, they have a trial against him before you know trying to accuse him falsely. Uh, it's not a trial really, it's like a mock trial. They try to accuse him falsely. And they are asking him, because they're expecting the Messiah, the Holy One, the, the Savior of the world to come. They ask him in Mark 14, 61, are you the Messiah, the Son, the Son, the, the, uh, the, um, the Son of the Blessed One, in other words, Son of God, Mark 14, 61. And Jesus answers, I am. So he affirms that. Right. So at that point, they have two choices. After Jesus did all the miracles, raised the dead, right. uh, gave the blind sight, mm -hmm. to um, either further investigate or come to a reasoned conclusion. What they do is they come to a conclusion, and their conclusion is false. They forget to ask Jesus one question, and that question is, where were you born? If they had, if they had asked him where he was born, yes. we wonder what his what his answer would have been. He mm -hmm. would have truthfully answered. Right. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us because they never asked him that question. Okay. the 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 important part is this: is he was born, as the Bible tells us, in Bethlehem in Judah, and that was the that was a place, his birthplace, uh, where he came into the world as a baby. He was born in Bethlehem in Judah. And that was, you heard, the terrible, the, the evil act of Herod then slaughtering the babies yes. a little while after, mm -hmm. causing Herod enough concern to go about that, to kill all male boys two years and under a terrible crime against humanity. It's terrible. Evil, evil, evil. And um, uh, that, but that was because he and the people, they checked in the Bible, the scriptures, the it was Bethlehem, Judah, that the Messiah would come. Okay. So for whatever reason, he wanted to make sure that everybody was killed, that he got Jesus. But by God's grace, he made it so there wasn't. But the Sanhedrin now, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees do not ask that. They assume, they just assume Jesus grew up in Nazareth, in the, in the Galilee region, where he's rejected, unfortunately, mm -hmm. in his own hometown. Nazareth is, it was in Galilee, not Judah. So they didn't ask, they never asked them that one question, where were you born? Amazing. It's amazing. And then what happens then is they assume he's a blasphemer or whatever they think they do. They hand him over to Pilate. He's then uh, sentenced to death by Pilate, even though Pilate, the Roman governor, deems him innocent. But um, anyways, uh, to, to, make, to just sum it up is um, in all of these events, uh, as Pilate then sentenced him to death and he is crucified as a horrible death, uh, on the cross uh, by the Romans uh, as a as a as a criminal, like um, no reason, there's other reason. Um, but what is, what happens at that time, or through all of that, is that there's messianic prophecies from the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Now, all the thing we're talking about is the New Testament prophecies, messianic prophecies, fulfilled in and through the life and death of Jesus at wow. that time. So. There's uh, Genesis 3.15, Micah 5.2, Daniel 9.26, Isaiah 7.14, just to mention a few. And there's things that happen to him at, on the cross where it cannot, be, it cannot be said that people made that up. In other words, there were prophecies saying, for example, people casting lots for his garments and from the Psalms and many other examples, from Isaiah especially. Right. He was pierced for our discussions. I'm just to mention a few. But the combination of all these fulfilled messianic prophecies mm -hmm. 
unparalleled in human history. It just cannot be dismissed. Amazing. So it's really something where you have to just stand for a moment and then, oh, oh, wow, okay. And then Jesus announces before he is crucified, he tells his disciples, I will rise after the third day. And that he did. Now, the resurrection is the, is the, is the main point because the resurrection in no other belief system or religion anywhere has anybody ever ruled, risen from the dead. In other words, resurrection died, come to life, but has a new body, has a, still has the old wounds in him. We don't exactly know. The Bible doesn't tell us that. Right. But the question is, is it actually historical? Is this event historical? In the end. So there's uh, three, three parts here that we just have to consider. That's the empty tomb of Jesus. Right. Then his resurrection appearances. Mm-hmm. And then the source of his disciples' change of behavior from unbelief to faith. Remember, they expected an earthly Messiah, like a king, like yes. who would then drive out the Romans. You yes. read that, right? Yeah. yeah. But he, um, that's not what happened. He died on the cross. So what did they do? They went away. I mean, some of them stand in the distance, or Peter is in the courtyard, or whatever, but they had a completely different expectancy. They ran away, they hid, and they were afraid. Yeah. And after he rose, all of a sudden, there's a change from behavior in, in them, from unbelief to faith, even to the point that they're that they're willing to die. So there's the empty tomb. Yeah. What's the big deal about an empty tomb? Well, the the leaders, all they would have to, had to do was produce a body. They couldn't. As as one example, right? Mm-hmm. The empty tomb. Yeah. And then they came up with things like the, somebody stole uh, the body, or there's so many theories that people came up with. Right. But none of them, none of them is plausible. Even so a lot of them, or that Jesus jumped off the cross. You can't believe what people come up with. Oh my it would be the first time in in human history where, under, when the Romans were in charge, when somebody was crucified, they made sure that person was dead. The Bible even tells us that Pilate asked the centurion, "Is he is he dead?" And the centurion affirms, right, under oath, right. that he would not lie, right? right? So he was dead. But the tomb is empty. We don't know what happened. The Bible doesn't tell us. But the tomb is empty. We have his resurrection appearances. Jesus appears to his disciples. Many times he appears to Mary Magdalene, and she thinks he's the gardener. And uh, for whatever reason, again, the Bible doesn't exactly tell us. Right. But uh, it appears to the disciples and also others, unnamed disciples, named unnamed disciples. So um, that's just some of the things that are just absolutely astonishing. Mm -hmm. And at one time, even was seen by 500 um, eyewitnesses simultaneously. Amazing. And, yeah. So we don't know how that is all possible, but with God, all things are possible, right? But mm-hmm. it's just, it's just the resurrection is the, and that's the basis of our Christian belief. And the, resurre- the resurrection really happened. It was a real event. It is, it is a fact. Yes. And it is, it is hard to, uh, hard to refute that in any which way. Somebody would have to bring evidence forward against the em- the empty tomb and all the other three pa- things. So the, the empty tomb combined with the resurrection appearances and the disciples' change of behavior from unbelief to faith and eventually even dying for uh, to serve the Lord Jesus. Right. So that's the, that's so. But that's all in the Bible. We mm-hmm. just want to briefly think about the historicity. Is there any outside biblical evidence? Yes. It's easy to say, oh, that somebody wrote the Bible, oh, they created their own story. Oh, okay, but what we need now, since we have the empty tomb, what we need to see, is there anything extra biblical that establishes the historical person of Jesus? Okay. Was there a human being called human, uh, human being called Jesus Christ? And yes, there is, um, there is the, um, the uh, Roman historian Tacitus, who in his writings, The Annals of Rome, Around AD 110, mm-hmm. it was written about 70, 80 years after his crucifixion of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Tacitus, the Annals of Rome, confirms uh, there, there, there was a person, historic person, Jesus Christ, uh, with his, he was crucified mm-hmm. with other factual details. And then there was also a non Roman historian, namely Josephus, who backs up that secular testimony as well. Okay. So we have the combination of biblical and extra-biblical testimony. So there's equally sufficient 
evidence that um, not only affirms the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but interestingly enough, with the empty tomb, also leaves room for belief and faith in Christ. Remember from the beginning, a baby is not born with a, this is how you're eternally right. saved. Right. So it's, it's astonishing how God made it so. Mm -hmm. And um, so what do we do then? So what do we do then with all of that? What does that mean for us? Now we're thinking about uh, God, uh, you know, with the, with, the, with the faith and the belief that God does exist. What does that mean for us as people? Yeah. So the knowledge, the knowledge of Jesus gives us a purpose and he has a God-given plan. And so we want to actively um, uh, engage and uh, seek out God's will. And um, we have a responsibility right, in, to, to, to foster and engage our personal relationship once we accept Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior. So we take a position of humility and surrender to God's will. Ask him through the Holy Spirit to reveal his plan and purpose for our lives, which God does have meaning for us. Right. Not just that, but plan and purpose. So things for us to do. And so that's another thing. Another last responsibility is to strengthen us, encourage us to grow in our personal relationship with him. So that's a responsibility. So we want to have reverence and obedience mm -hmm. in our lives and our worship or testimony should reflect our faith in Jesus Christ and that we become effective witnesses for the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. it. And if you I want to read... Uh, two passages here. Okay. Right. Just to so does that help a little bit? Yeah, that, that helps. A okay. Lot. Yeah. yeah so uh, can we prove that God exists? No. Do we have to? No, because God has proven Himself in and through His Word, the Bible, and yes. revealed the world in and through the person, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Jesus tells us something really interesting. We want to also consider when mm -hmm. He's talking to the Pharisee Nicodemus uh, before His crucifixion. In John three sixteen, John chapter three, sixteen to twenty one. So this is the important part we want to understand, mm -hmm. and that's for us believers and to share the good news with others. A uh, very important uh, truth Jesus shares here. These are all Jesus's words. For this is how God loved the world; He gave His one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. God bless you in his word. That was John 3, 16, 21 in the NLT, New Living Translation, paraphrase. So in other words, I don't know, that does that speak to you? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. 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 What, what, what basically this says means basically... Um, God doesn't send people to hell, so to say, as some people may say, people send themselves to hell. Yeah. But then on the other side, believing in Christ spares us that, because in faith, in and through Jesus, he spares us that. Yes. And that's our calling. When Jesus calls us, and everybody, and that's what we hope many people will explore all this, what we just talked about. Mm -hmm. I hope you will, you know, read more, ask more questions. Yes. Think about all this. Yeah. And uh, Jesus says in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, 28 to, uh, verses 28 to 30, again the NLT, mm -hmm. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you, is light. God bless the reading of his word. So that's pretty much it. Any, well, thank yeah, you very does much. Does help a bit? Yeah, that yeah. helps a All lot. All right. Yeah. Is it okay if I just say a short prayer? Yes, please. All right. Thank you. Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you for this blessed day coming together here. And uh, um, we, 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 we appreciate, we're always excited about asking many questions. In this case, we have, does God exist? How do we know? 
and uh, we learned about you today uh, through you as God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. You have revealed yourself in and through the Bible, and um, there are many different things we have to consider. Uh, uh, your your life, death, uh, resurrection with the empty tomb. These are these are sort of proofs uh, of the resurrection. Well, not scientifically in that sense. They really leave room for belief. So um, this is our open invitation to come to you freely and explore and and uh, more about or read more about you in the Gospels and enter uh, repent of our sins and enter. A personal relationship with you, our Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing we can do. You've done it all on the cross, which God then confirmed um, after you had said it is finished and you rose. The resurrection confirms that every word you said, Lord Jesus, is true. And so we can trust you. And that's our prayer that everything comes to you while there's still time. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for looking after us. And we pray this for all people, no matter who it may be. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your holy name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. And, and always remember, the best Bible is an open Bible.